Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, on behalf of Virtual PATSIC and the National Association of Medical Examiners Workforce Committee, thank you for attending the Forensic Pathology Virtual Open House today. Just as a reminder, the session is being recorded. We want to thank you all for your attendance, and we hope this answers some of your questions about careers, education, and training today in forensic pathology. My name is Jenna Angst, and I'm the president of Virtual PathSig, as well as a member of NAMES Workforce Development and Social Media Committees. I'd like to give a special shout out to MJ Menendez, NAMES Executive Vice President and Chair of the Workforce Development Committee, as well as Dr. Maura DeJoseph, the Chair of NAMES Fellowship Committee. I'd like to also invite the other members of Virtual PathSig to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Ting Xiao, and I'm the event co-chair. Hello, my name is Joy Wei, and I am the current social media co-chair. Great. Now we'd like to introduce our panelists. Let's go ahead and get started with Dr. Gill. Uh, hi, I'm Jim Gill. I'm a forensic pathologist, uh, and I'm the chief medical examiner for the state of Connecticut. My name is Christine Zagizi. I'm one of the deputy medical examiners in the Washington, D.C. Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Hello, everybody. I am Lorenzo Gito. I am a forensic pathologist, and I'm working as an assistant medical examiner and a research director at the Cook County Medical Examiner Office in Chicago. Hello. Hi, I'm Dr. Marcel Castor, and I am an associate medical examiner here in DeKalb County, Georgia. Great. Now we'd like to introduce our medical examiner um, from NAMES Workforce Committee that's going to be assisting with today's session and helping respond to your questions in the chat. Uh, Dr. Hanberg. Hi, I'm Eric Hanberg. I'm a forensic pathologist and medical examiner in Fort Bend County in Texas. Great. We are also glad that, to have you here and thank you for taking the time out of your day. My name is Ting and Joy and I will be moderating the Q&A portion for the session today. And just to give a layout of how the event will run today, we asked questions when you um, RSVP'd and chose the most commonly asked to go through all attendees are muted except for the panelists. The event will be recorded and we will post it online in about a week. The first 30 minutes is a Q&A with the pre-submitted questions and we'll ask a question and ask one of the panelists to answer first. And if anyone else on the panel wants to add anything, please feel free to chime in. The second half of the session will involve participants uh, being assigned to five five-minute breakout sessions with each program. If you have any program-specific questions, we ask that you hold them until that time. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. Right now, we're going to start questions. So the first question is for Dr. Giese. What do you like and not like about forensic pathology? Okay, so the, I'll say what I don't like is I only dislike two things. Paperwork and maggots are the things I dislike. I don't like stuff moving around when I'm doing the exam. <laughs> Forensic pathology is a lot of paperwork because we do construct a very thorough report. And I'm very particular about proofing my reports and making sure that everything is well organized. One of the reasons you have to do that is because we are often called to court several years after we do cases. So you have to be well organized and make sure that you write your reports so that you can recall exactly what happened. We're getting called to court a lot now for stuff that happened four and five years ago, one because of COVID, but also because our justice system is not very quick. Things I love about my job, I love the technical aspect of my job. I was actually interested in surgery before I switched over to pathology. And this is a really cool way to learn anatomy, to understand and solve cases without being stressed about, you know, possibly hurting somebody. <laughs> so I like that part of it. I do enjoy the thought process, making sure that I have all the clues to get what the cause of death is, to collect evidence and make sure that the people who are held responsible for that death, if it is a crime, are going to be going to jail and be be sentenced and everything. So those are the parts I enjoy. I do also enjoy teaching. I act as our fellowship program director in DC. And I love teaching residents and medical students. Um, anybody who's over 18 that really wants to come to our office, I'm always trying to bring them in so that they can see the work that we do. One of the things that we don't get a lot of is praise for when we do a good job, but there are some families that occasionally will call or they'll give you a, a card or something and say that, you know, you really were helpful in helping me understand what happened with my loved one. I have a couple of cards that I've saved in my, like my backpack and that are really special to me because a lot of times we don't get thanked for what we do. So that part of it is kind of rough, but when we do, it's, it's a really good feeling. I also enjoy the people that I work with. Our next question is for Dr. Gill. In your opinion, what makes a good forensic pathologist? 
Yeah, I think someone who has a, a curiosity about things and is inquisitive uh, and wants to try and figure things out. I think that's one of the things I like most about the, the work is that it's something different every day. You never know what you're going to see. And you kind of get the first one to try and figure out, figure out why this young person died or if this is a homicide or a suicide. And so there are a lot of different components to the work, public health components. You deal with police, attorneys, families. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how much we interact with families, actually. And that can be very you know, rewarding as well. So I think having some empathy and, you know, being able to and being able to teach a lot of our work when we testify in court or even speak to families is teaching. And we need to explain complex medical things to lay people and, and make them understand you know, what we're talking about. So uh, empathy, teaching ability, that curiosity, I think all would, would be very helpful. Okay, hey, great. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to add to that question? Okay. So our next question is for Dr. Castor. How would you describe the pay in forensic pathology? The pay in forensic pathology can be a bit varied, but I do think it pays well overall. It can range from as low as 180 to as high as I think four to five hundred thousand a year if you are a chief medical examiner and also if you're able to develop your own book of consult work as well, where you're doing a record review for attorneys, that is also another way to make money if you're more entrepreneurial. And also private autopsies as well is also another lucrative avenue. So it's very easy for somebody fresh out of training to be making between 250 to 350 depending upon the setting that they're in. So if you're strictly government, then maybe you may be a bit more restricted and you may have to find a your own setup to find more outside work initially. But I think if you are genuinely entrepreneurial and you're willing to go after it, it wouldn't be surprising for your typical forensic pathologist to be making over 400 mid-career. In my office specifically, is a public-private partnership. So there I have my salary based upon the government, which is public and also I can just say it 250. Based on my private work, I can easily go over 300 with a little bit of private work as well. And this is still early on. So give me a few years. It might easily be well beyond that. Thank you. And our next question is for all of the panelists, starting with Dr. Jito. What does a day in a life of a trainee at your program look like in terms of hours? Is it family friendly? And what's the lifestyle like? Lifestyle and work-life balance is pretty great in general. A regular day here, the fellows are required to be here for 40 hours per week, so eight hours per day. They basically go in the morning doing autopsies, and they are exposed progressively to cases of different difficulty. Start starting at the beginning of the fellowship with like easy cases and progressively moving to hard cases. Always there is a supervisor with them so that they can gain experience and become confident for each type of cases. Uh, the nice thing, my office here, is that it's like li living in a small family environment. Everybody knows each other. There is a very strong collaboration among all the departments in my office, but also among the people in the same departments. So when you are working on your case, there is maybe you're not sure about something, you can just step by another pathologist and just ask questions and they will help you 100%. Everybody's very supportive. Uh, regarding the lifestyle, again, I think it's a very good one. Uh, of course, it depends, you know, the office is busy, so you will have a lot of cases, but that's not a downside. Actually, that makes you ready for when you become an attending. You will be exposed to a lot of cases during your work day in the morning. And then when you're done, you can enjoy basically your life. Most of the people here, they have kids, they have family. We, I don't know anybody that is like stressed or burned out. I think that mostly it's also a personal, you know, reaction to things. But for what I see, the system that we are using here helps everybody to be confident and comfortable for whatever they're doing. Also, being in a big city like Chicago, if you like, big cities also gives you a lot of opportunity because it's a very diverse, it's a very beautiful city that offers a lot of things to everybody. I will say that it's a pretty well-balanced work lifestyle. So I just wanted to add, I, I agree with all of what you said. Part of it also is the teaching aspect of it. So we do like to incorporate didactics into 
Also making sure that you do the cases that increase with difficulty as you go on. So by the time you get to training, you'll have done probably 30 to 50 autopsies in your residency already. So you're, you're kind of used to, um, or more, but you, <laughs> if you're really interested in forensics, but you start to do more complicated cases, you're going to start to talk to more families, talk to law enforcement. That will have you come to court with us when we testify. I did my because you will be on television and people will recognize you. So you want to make sure that you're prepared for that as well. So really the differences between residency and fellowship are stepping up to that level, really taking ownership of your case. And then you're going to have, of course, more complicated cases, especially homicides. You know, you know, for our fellows in, in Connecticut, usually they're on autopsy two or three days a week. So the other days are kind of paper days where they can work on paperwork, maybe go to court if, if someone is, is testifying. They also do separate rotations of the crime lab and the toxicology lab and, and crime scene as well. They also spend some time with our investigators going to, to regular um, death scenes. Pretty much a nine to five job, I think, in most places. Uh, maybe one weekend a month, our fellows work just during the day to come in and do cases. And then it, towards the second part of the year, they'll start to take some call because that's important, but uh, they take it from home. And it's really just questions from the investigators about should we bring this case in uh, or, or not. So I think it is a very reasonable you know, kind of lifestyle. You're not around the clock and uh, you, know, you don't get calls from patients at two in the morning usually. You, know. you don't have to deal with insurance companies, uh, things like that. Okay. Um, thank you for that. To segue off of that, the next question is for all of the panelists, starting with you, Dr. Gell. For your specific program, what will the trainees learn in the aspect of cases, complexities, court, crime scenes, et cetera? Yeah, so they, they really get the whole spectrum. We have you know, anthropologists, we have an in-house forensic anthropologist, so they get to spend some time with her. As I mentioned before, crime lab, crime scene, uh, toxicology. Uh, and then we, we gradually start you performing autopsies, you know, one a day uh, in your autopsy days, then eventually two. And then some days towards the end of the year, maybe three. And we kind of balance them. You're always working with three other forensic pathologists, you know, medical examiners in the same room. So we always kind of assign one doctor as the teaching doctor. And at the beginning of the year, that's all they do is just teach you. The year goes on, they'll be doing a case next to you, but they'll still be there to, to help you and, and answer your questions and so forth. So you're never kind of just left alone to do a case. And then they have a chance, the opportunity to go to, to watch us in court. And towards the end of the year, sometimes we'll have cases that come up where the medical examiner is no longer working with us uh, and we need someone to testify. And so we've had our fellows be able to go and actually testify in real cases in court on homicides. So they get some of that um, experience as well. This next question is for Dr. Gizi. What can applicants do during residency to make them more competitive for forensic pathology fellowship? And also what can applicants do during medical school? Sure. So um, in both instances, um, you can try to attend national meetings. So NAME or AAFS are examples of national meetings where you can learn more about forensics and kind of understand what is going on in the field. Do you have any interesting cases when you do autopsies as a resident? You can try to present those at those national meetings. You can try to be a moderator just so you can kind of network and get to know people in the field. We have a very small field, so <laughs> it's a nice opportunity to understand what different offices do. Um, another thing you can do in residency is take an away rotation at one of those institutions that you're interested in. We have month-long rotations in our office. Even if you're a medical student, you can still take a rotation. If you're an undergrad, we have uh, summer internships you can do as well. So there's plenty of opportunities to try to um, find out what the field is like. And I really recommend that because you want to make sure you understand what you're getting into before you commit to something like forensics. It's a very interesting field, but there are some challenges. Sometimes it's difficult to have harder cases or cases with kids, and you want to make sure that you can understand that and handle all of that. So those are the things I would recommend. Hi, uh, Eric Kanberg. I'd like to add just one thing to that. I agree with everything you said, and I just want to highlight that for medical students and residents, membership of the National Association of Medical Examiners is free. You can join it. It's free. It is the number one place to network with us and network with the people who are going to get you a fellowship, get you a job, and basically understand more about the field and what we do. So please join NAME. 
it, it really is worth your time. You'll get lots of opportunities to do research. You'll meet people and you'll just get to see the kind of people that you're going to spend your career working with. So check out the name. The other thing about name, you know, as someone mentioned, the, the annual meeting, residents, medical students can get free registration and the name foundation even offers some stipends to help with travel and so forth. So it may not even you know, really cost you uh, that much to, to attend. And, you know, there is a, a shortage of forensic pathologists, so there are a lot of jobs out there. And that's actually, I think, also what's kind of driving up the salaries uh, in many places as well. Hey, thank you for that. Our next question is going to be for Dr. Gietto. How important is it for medical students and residents for research and publication? For me, personally, it's essential. Uh, for a reason, I started doing research like more than 10 years ago when I was like a medical student. And I can tell you that that really helped me becoming more open-minded and more interested in the field. I know that sometimes it takes time and students and residents, they don't have time. But I think it's something that really adds value to your own background, to your personal background, and um, also opens you out of different possibility to follow up for what Dr. Gill just said about the name. There are a lot of residents, a lot of medical students are coming to the name every year to the conference to present cases or real like big research projects. Uh, only this year, I don't know how many participants were there, but I remember there was a huge poster session with posters from residents from all over the United States and also outside the United States. Uh, only for my office, I think we brought like eight or nine different abstracts and most of the people were not even in my office. Because since I take care of the research part, when people are coming rotating here, I ask them if they want to do research and they, I try actually to push them to do research. And when they want to do that, we just write a simple case report and they really like the experience. The thing you must have someone, of course, that supervises you, someone that tells you what to do, but is a great experience. And I think that not only for your CV, but just it gives you an understanding of the field because you learn a lot of things, you know, going through the literature. But it's also a great experience from a personal experience, a personal point of view. You just decide that you want to do something that you have never done in your life. And this is something that you can use in your future practice. And actually, if you do a great research, you can actually change the practice. So I really think that it's an essential thing. You know, I, I mean, I can add to that, that, you know, I mean, I, I like to do research and I, I agree it's, it is, I think, very important for our field. But just as any other area of medicine, you don't have to do research. It's really kind of up to you. It does open some doors, I think, initially, getting you some networking and ex exposure and so forth. But during my forensic pathology fellowship, there were four of us. Two of us became forensic medical examiners, didn't do any research at all. And two of us did some. There are some fellowship programs that are a little more academically inclined than others. So it really is kind of up to you. I mean, I, I would encourage it. Uh, I mean, I, I think it is a positive thing to have, but it's certainly not required. And then I just want to add that I, I personally am not research driven or inclined myself, but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate it. And I do want to add that just because you're a, a pre-med or a medical student doesn't mean that you can't contribute meaningfully. Dr. Gill can attest that at this last name, just a couple months ago, I don't even know if it was that long ago, just a few weeks ago, we were at name and there was a poster that was made by a, a medical student turned resident in the interim that I was so excited by that I went around and found Dr. Gill and found other chiefs from around the country to say, this is blowing my mind that we've just learned this, something so exciting. And that was made by a medical student. So you guys absolutely have something to contribute. The next question is also open to all the panelists. What qualities do program directors look for other than the generic having passion for forensic pathology, what gives a candidate an honest chance to be considered and how do you discern between genuine interests versus superficial responses? All right, so some of the things that, that we look for really are your letters of recommendation too. We wanna to see specific examples of how you are able to overcome either an obstacle or deal with some of the challenges or um, autopsy cases that you've had. One of the things we want to see is that you're able to manage a couple different things at one time. We don't want you to take someone who's really overwhelmed with the caseload or the type of work that we do. Obviously, if you've made it this far in your medical career, you're a pretty smart person. <laughs> so we're really looking for some of those more personal characteristics and being able to deal with the workload. 
I'll share with what my program director said that I should look for if I ever ran a program. Someone that is willing to work hard and also willing to learn from everyone, from attending all the way down to text. Everyone has something to share with you. We don't know everything and be open and willing to listen and take feedback. If you can take feedback well, that is a huge plus. Um, and our last question for the Q&A that were pre-submitted is, if you plan to do multiple fellowships, does the order in which you complete them matter? I would say strategically, it might be best to do the more clinical one first and do forensic second. So most, if people do fellowships, some of the ones that they consider are neuropathology and then follow that with forensics. Another one that I personally did was cardiothoracic followed up by forensics as well. And if neuropath, if you are genuinely interested in neuropath, there is such a huge backlog and you're an entrepreneur at all, like you will have more than enough work because right now, currently, some of the people I know, they have like a two month wait. If anybody knows a neuropathologist, that's interested. My office is also looking for one as well. Now, ha having an extra board like that, I think, does make you a little more marketable. I was looking for someone who had both forensic and uh, uh, neuropath, and we ended up getting two. So we were, we were kind of lucky. Um, but it's not required. I mean, you know, you are going to get training in neuropathology and cardiovascular pathology and pediatric pathology during your fellowship and so forth. Uh, but sometimes you do need that little extra expertise. Um, and it's nice to have that available. Okay, great. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to add or anything just additional about their program that they'd like to address to the room? One quick thing about um, as far as those um, month away rotations during residency, um, the ASCP and the CAP actually sponsor uh, those as well. They have multiple positions where they will fund you to go. They'll, they'll give you a few thousand dollars to go and spend a month at another office, another jurisdiction for a forensic rotations, just keep that in mind too. And I'll just add to the question about when to do these multiple certifications. So one thing is when you leave your AP training, you're gonna do significantly less histology than you did during AP training, during your forensic pathology training and likely during your career. So if you're gonna do additional AP training, that's when it's gonna be the freshest. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is just reality, is that when you're done with forensic pathology fellowship, you're going to be offered jobs in the two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollar range, or you're going to be offered fellowships in the sixty to eighty thousand dollar range. It becomes a little harder and a little harder to take that half a million dollar hit if you're already out of the system. So I would just say have it in mind that you know real life does play a factor, and the more you can combine things, like say in an AP NP track, that's worth considering. Oh, and also I did my fellowship in Miami. Miami, unfortunately, wasn't able to, to make it today. But if anyone has questions about Miami, I'm happy to field questions. Okay, great. Um, so I just threw a PDF in the chat. Uh, this is a document sent by Dr. Gill um, on behalf of NAME going over what it is to be a forensic pathologist and what the training looks like and just kind of an overview of all of that. So I encourage everybody to download that and just take a quick look. It's a great overview. And with that, thank you so much to our panelists. So the next portion of this event will involve four or five minute breakout sessions with each of the programs. Feel free to turn on your video, unmute, and when the five minutes is up, attendees will automatically switch to the next breakout session. I've assigned a member of our group to each room. Um, so if there are any issues within the session, feel free to reach out with, to any of the PathSig members. I'll also stay present in the main session to help you troubleshoot. If for some reason you drop off and need to jump back in, just holler at me and let me know, and I will be glad to put you back in whatever session uh, you were in. Before we switch, did at some point when this was published, did you put our contact information in case anyone wants to get a hold of one of us specifically after? No, I didn't, but that's a good point. Um, if the panelists would like to go ahead and just put on their uh, best contact information into the chat, um, that would be helpful just in case for some reason anybody gets disconnected and needs to reach out with program-specific questions. That would be very helpful. And while you all are doing that, I'm going to get the breakout rooms uh, set up. So um, let's see if we can get this going. Okay, any final questions, remarks,
comments, feedback. Thanks for putting all this together. I will say my one thing that I regret, and I think it speaks highly of the field, is I like these breakout rooms, but it kills me I didn't get to spend more time talking to Lorenzo and all my other friends from this group. So hello, everybody. It's so nice to see your faces again and try to find another field where I am genuinely this excited to see everyone that works around the country. I we'll second give, that. <laughs> we'll give you all your own breakout room next time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Joy, take it away. Okay, um, first of all, I want to apologize. Um, it went a little bit over, but I hope it was worth it. Yes. Um, it's good to hear. Um, and on, on behalf of PADSIG, we want to thank everyone for attending, all of our amazing panelists, and all of you for taking time out of your day. Um, as a last minute reminder, um, just to let everyone know, these sessions are all being recorded and they will be uploaded to our um, our PathSig website in a few days. Also, we will be sending everyone who emailed uh, via RSVP the feedback on the session. So you can give us some feedbacks, maybe suggestions, anything you like, didn't like. And lastly, we want to remind everyone that next Saturday on the second hosting and networking session 101, also, uh, we have registration that um, on live events and webinars section of our website on virtualpathsig.org. And also for anyone who's interested, AIM is also hosting medical student webinars monthly. On um, the next one, the next sessions are on fetal death and placenta with Dr. Daniel Butler, Associate Professor at the University of South Carolina in Charleston. And you can register for those at thename.org. If you haven't already, please follow us on Instagram, X, Facebook, TikTok, and LinkedIn. And once again, thank you for everyone for attending, and we look forward to hearing from you.